can't help but think that Satan's in hell with the demon sitting around a table playing the new version of Scrabble. Grace, mercy, and peace to you, my friends, in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My friends, the world is full of people who, who want to deny the threat of danger. People who, who want to pretend that everything is going to be okay, everything's going to be fine just because that's the way they want it, because we all get what we want all the time, right? I mean, that's how things work. That's how life works. But there are people who actually practically act like this all the time, complete denial. And it seems absurd to us who, who live in the face of threat and danger all the time, people who, who feel hardship and suffering and agony and all the difficulties of life. It's like, how can anyone think like this? And especially today, given that yesterday we were watching on the news, if you saw this, you know, Iran launching drones and cruise missiles and all that stuff at, at Israel. So in the face of war, how could we ever pretend like the world is just a peaceful, blissful place all the time? Nothing bad ever happens. But make no doubt about it, my friends, the world is full of fools who want to fool themselves. Our sermon text this morning is John 10, verses 11 through 13, where we read, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. <laughs> this past week, my wife told me about a news article that speaks to our world of fools, uh, of people who want to pretend that there's there's nothing even negative in this world, that there's there's not the slightest even hint that a wolf exists. And so, you know, if that's the case, then who needs a hired hand, let alone who needs the good shepherd, who needs a savior? To use the language from our reading, did you see this? Did you see this news article? Mattel, was it Mattel? I think it was Mattel, announced a new version of Scrabble. Did you see this? This new version will be more, you guessed it, inclusive because, you know, DEI, got to be. Specifically for Zoomers, for Gen Z, because apparently, as their studies show, the new generation is fearful of even the thought of losing. Not even just losing itself, but the thought of losing. Yes, so. Uh, even losing a board game causes them anxiety. And, and that's what's different about this version is that they're going to change the rules. They're going to change the scoring system so that nobody has to fear losing. Now this new game, uh, the Scrabble Together, it's less competitive and it's more cooperative, which means it's less fun. But it's, it's the same thing that we saw with the millennial generation. It's the everybody gets a trophy, we don't keep score when we play sports. It's that thing that spoiled the millennial generation and the Gen Xers before them. It's, it's the error that the church made when we decided after Vatican II that changing the church's historic liturgy was a good thing, to contemporize it, to have you know praise bands and screens in our sanctuaries and to put in coffee bars and make everything casual. That spoiled the boomer generation when they came of age, and we're still reaping the benefits of that. Benefits in quotation marks or scare quotes, right? It's, it's the euthanasia problem. There's many examples, but it's this problem, as it was expressed here recently in, in Humboldt County, in the Lost Coast Outpost, that online newspaper, the, the opinion piece written by Barry Evans, the regular column of uh, Growing Old Ungracefully, I think that's what it's called, where Mr. Evans admits his cowardice as a man by telling the entire world that he's so afraid of any discomfort that he wishes California would go from bad to worse. I mean, it's already seems like it's already worse, but even more worse. <laughs> Allowing for medical assistance in dying made, aka paid assassination by medically trained monsters, to include Alzheimer's and dementia patients. This guy has a regular column putting out this kind of filth. I don't know if uh, th those of you who are local who, who saw this, did you see this confession of cowardice that he put out there? He is so afraid of discomfort or of his wife causing him discomfort, should she ever be diagnosed with dementia, 
that he wants the legal ability to put his wife out of her misery or to or to, to be put out of his own misery, he says, right? That's what he's saying is he could he want to make it sound reasonable or even to put his wife out of his misery if she should be the one who needs to be put down. It's the result of living in a culture that lives in denial of the wolf and idolizes safety. A world that wants to take away every single conceivable cause of suffering, wants to wrap everybody in bubble wrap, wants to hover parent everyone, wants to put bumpers on every bowling lane, wants to make sure no kids can play on the playground because they might break a leg, they might get hurt, wants everything to be in a padded room where the crazy people are because that's what makes us safe. And yes, that's what makes us crazy. Husbands would rather put their sick wives down like dogs than serve them in their time of illness. We live in a culture now that is it doesn't know the Christian vow of the wedding ceremony where we say in sickness or in health because we're not in a Christian culture anymore. We live in a culture where people get married on a whim by anybody who just takes an online course to become uh, you know an, an officiant of the state. We live in a place where people don't take vows seriously, where if you don't like the way your wife looks one morning, you can divorce her. No fault divorce. She could tick you off and you're gone. You could bounce at any waking moment, get in a car accident, and all of a sudden your wife is dismembered or your husband is dismembered. You can dip. It doesn't matter. You're gone. Nobody takes their word seriously. Just kill off the old gal if she gets sick. Change her in for a new model if she starts to, you know, get a little loose there in the shorts. If she's not, you know, as tight and firm as she used to be when she was a young woman. Just get the, you, the new updated model. Go look on OnlyFans. There's a whole selection for you. Maybe you can order in a bride from the Ukraine. This is the kind of sick world we live in. We can't bear to lose a board game. So, yeah, why on earth would we be willing to bear the burden of suffering as a caregiver for someone else in their time of need. And then we can, we even make it sound very pious and, and very selfless. We say, well, I wouldn't want to be a burden on anybody else. So I think we should have made so that I wouldn't, I wouldn't put anybody out. No, you want to put people out. God intended it for that, to be that way. God wants us to be able to serve our neighbor and he wants us to serve our neighbors. I often get this as a pastor. I visit you know, the homebound and, and they're, they're very aging and they're very old and they can't do much on their own. And they ask, pastor, why is God still, why is he leaving me here? What, what is the purpose? Why would I remain? I can't do anything good. I'm of no use. I'm just a burden. False. That's the devil's lie because you can pray. And, and even in the case of a dementia patient, if you can't pray, you, by virtue of your dependence, needing others to help you, you give people a reason to be of service. You force people, if you want to say it that way, to serve their neighbor, even if it's only for a paycheck. You give your neighbor a reason to do something for someone else. And that in itself is worthwhile. The world that we live in is a horrible, rotten place. The The word for all of this, Barry Evans, can't lose a board game, can't do all of this, I need to have the whole world bend to my own you know, inadequacies. To avoid discomfort, we have a word for all of this. It's called selfish. We are not a selfless culture. We are a selfish culture. We live in a selfish age that just wants to retire poolside and live in perpetual ease and entertainment. No, there's another word for that. It's called soft. We live in a soft culture, a soft world. Listen to what Mr. Evans said in his article. As the California law now stands, MAID, M-A-I-D, permits assisted death if two physicians confirm that death is likely, not certainly, likely, to occur within six months. You know, because doctors are always right about their diagnosis. They never get anything wrong. And that absent intervention, the period between now and then, is, again, likely, not definitely, likely to be painful. Now, here's the kicker. 
not just for the dying person who may or may not actually be dying, but who is likely dying, but maybe painful for the caregivers. Can you believe this is where we're at in our society? You can now off your family member if caring for them is painful, not for them so much, but as for you. It's painful for you in their time of illness that you have to be put out and displaced and be of service to your neighbor and serve them and love them. Yes, it could be years. What a privilege it would be for you if you were put out that way and had to live a life of serving your neighbor for years. But we will never know that in our society anymore because if the moment someone is a discomfort to us, take them out by order of two doctors. If it seems likely, it may be painful for you, the caregiver. We live among, among a truly perverse people, soft people, sick people, spoiled people, selfish people, and we ourselves are among them. We live among a people so terrified of suffering that they would rather commit murder than serve others. And yes, that's homicide and suicide. Both are murder. Murder of the other, the same, the one like you, and murder, murder of yourself. Everywhere, every single place we look, we see what the Bible calls hired hands, what our gospel reading today calls hired hands. We see people fleeing at the sight of the wolf, so to speak, at the sight of danger, at the sight of suffering, at the sight of discomfort. Another example of this, it's an older one, but it comes from the woman who is the heretical female bishop, as if there can be such a thing. I mean, a female bishop. There, there can be heretical bishops, but there is no such thing as a female bishop. But she is the head of the apostate church known as the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the ELCA, the largest quote-unquote Lutheran church body in America. Yeah, they're, they're not evangelical. They're not Lutheran. They're not a church. And you really, they're hard, it's hard to say they even stand up for American principles. They're nothing their name says, but that's beside the point. In 2017, this woman acting like a bishop masquerading and playing pretend like a bishop, said in an interview that if, <laughs> if hell exists, it's empty. And I wish we could say that what she meant was that it's empty because all the demonic monsters left the land of fire and brimstone to be here on earth possessing people like Barry Evans. But no, that's not what she meant. No, she likes to play pretend and probably prefers to play Scrabble together, the new version. She, she likes to pretend things are as she wants them to be, not as they actually are. So why would she say this? Because it's wishful thinking. If you can wish away hell, then you all automatically wish away the discomfort of thinking about your loved ones going there, right? It's too uncomfortable to think about people going to hell. So let's pretend like it doesn't exist. Let's just slap a rainbow on our Bible and think happy thoughts all day long. Thoughts of gumdrops and butterflies and rainbows and bunnies. Let's do that for a while. Don't ever bring up anything discomfort, discomforting, anything uncomfortable. Don't talk about hell. Don't talk about that place. Don't talk about death. And when death does happen, let's slap some makeup on grandma and put her in her nice dress and put her up front to so pretend like everything's okay. This woman cares nothing for Christ's sheep. Wolves and hired hands don't. But despite our age's cultural game of make-believe, cruel game though it is, the truth remains. There are indeed real dangers all around us, real threats. There are real situations where you lose the game, guy, Yes, when you play the board game, you will lose from time to time. There are situations where real people develop real illnesses that pain them, and not just for a short time, but actually pain them and their loved ones for years on end. Yes, where people actually suffer a prolonged period of time. And then there is also the reality that where people do actually go to hell. Do we wish that was not the case? Sure, of course. Yeah, God doesn't will for anyone to go hell, to hell either, but it is the reality. If you reject Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are going to hell. You can be the sweetest old lady in the planet 
on the planet, in the earth, in the world? Yeah, that's what I mean to say. You can be the sweetest person in the world. You can be the nicest guy according to your neighbor's disposition. But that doesn't matter if you don't believe in the way, the truth, and the life, the only way to the Father. If you don't believe in Jesus fulfilling the law for you, it doesn't matter how sweet you are. Your farts could smell like roses. It doesn't matter. You're still going to hell if you reject Jesus. That's the truth, friends. That's the truth. Yes, even for people you love in your family, this is why Jesus' death on the cross, the crucifixion of Christ, is such good news. The reality is there is a wolf, and he can be seen as we read in John 10. But the reality is also that he's nothing compared to the good shepherd. Nothing. Not a threat. When you factor in Jesus, Jesus is the good shepherd, and he's not afraid to confront the dangerous wolf. Not even with a whole pack of ravenous demons alongside him. He, he'll take on all of them. He doesn't flee into a world of pretend, murmuring happy thoughts while Satan orders up order after order of lamb chop, devouring and having a feast, a smorgasbord of all the sheep. No, our Lord Jesus Christ is not afraid of discomfort and danger. He's not afraid of being whipped and beaten to a bloody pulp and then nailed to a cross that was, that was raised up so that he hung from human thumbtacks, suffocating under the weight of his own body, being pulled by gravity to the earth until he died. He's not afraid of that. He wasn't afraid to be speared in his side or, or to have his, a crown of thorns pressed down onto his skull, piercing his his head, he wasn't afraid to be forsaken by God. Yes, forsaken by his very own father. He wasn't afraid of that. He wasn't afraid because, well, Jesus isn't a pansy. He isn't just playing pretend. He's not playing good shepherd. He is the good shepherd. And when you're a shepherd, that means not only do you hang out with cute, cuddly sheep that look all soft and fluffy, but you also have a duty to defend the flock from the threats, be they wolves or lions or other people or hired hands or even the sheep themselves. Jesus is a real man. Unlike Barry Evans and unlike the Bishop of the ELCA. And he is a good man, the good shepherd, unlike all of us. We're not good. He is our good shepherd. And he isn't afraid of the wolf. Not in the least. Where in our day and age, we pretend that the big bad wolf is just grandma with oversized dentures. Jesus acknowledges the reality that the wolf is a wolf. And those big canines in his mouth are actually for devouring God's children. They are for devouring sheep. Don't let that language confuse you. One and the same beast, a Christian. The wolf has those powerful chompers for a reason, the better to eat you with, my dear. And so having never played the new Scrabble game or ever been in a little, little league sport where everybody got a trophy and nobody ever kept score because you wouldn't want to hurt somebody's feelings, Jesus threw safety to the wind, not even thinking twice about it, and went to the cross for you. Went to the place of danger and death for you. He suffered and felt the teeth of the wolf take his life for you so that you would be spared the hell that false teachers, be they in news columns or presiding as quote-unquote bishops of church bodies, pretend doesn't exist. 
You know, that is a wildly outrageous thing for a so-called Christian to say, let alone a so-called Christian clergy person, clergyman, man it should be, that hell doesn't exist. I mean, I mean, I know if you're a Christian watching this, you know that. But it's even more outrageous than we first think it is. To deny hell's existence is literally, friends, literally to deny the very purpose of our Lord's crucifixion. Do we understand that? If we want to pretend hell doesn't exist, we're pretending Jesus doesn't exist. The sternness of the law is in direct correlation with the sweetness of the gospel. No threat of hell, no reality of hell, no reward of heaven through Christ's blood. That's, that's how it works. I'm reading a good little book right now, a, a book of sermons by a, a Victorian-era Christian writer, actually, George MacDonald. You may, you may know of George MacDonald from his novels and his novellas. He was highly influential in C.S. Lewis's conversion to the Christian faith. And in C.S. Lewis's love of the story and the myth to convey the Christian faith. Now, in this little book, he writes, The mission of Jesus was from the same source and with the same object as the punishment of our sins. Hope you heard that right. He goes on to explain it. He came, Jesus came, to work along with our punishment. We often talk like Jesus came to take our punishment, yes, but we think that means he is against the punishment. No. McDonald continues, he came to side with the punishment. And he set us free from our sins by doing so. No man is safe from our sins. No man is safe from hell until he is free from his sins. For hell is God's and not the devil's. Hell is on the side of God and man. Do you hear that? That's what scripture says when it says to fear him who can destroy both your body and your soul. Only God can do that. Hell is on the side of God and man to free the child of God from the corruption of death. Not one soul will ever be redeemed from hell but by being saved from his sins, from the evil in him. If hell be needful to save him, hell will blaze and the worm will writhe and bite until he takes refuge in the will of the Father. Hell is God's. How dare a so-called Christian deny its existence? To do so is to deny Christ's incarnational mission that culminated in his crucifixion. <laughs> the cross of Christ. It's to deny the gospel. To deny our good shepherd facing the wolf and in doing so tending to his sheep, tending to you. It's to deny the very source of our Lord's gifts the source of our healing, the source of our feeding. Who would want to do such a thing? It's, it's to deny our Father's love and the means by which we who were lost are brought home to the good pasture, brought into Israel, made a part of the Lord's flock. It's to deny the very source of justice which destroys the fat and the strong, the wicked who fleece the sheep. Now, see, it doesn't do any good to pretend that uncomfortable experiences don't exist. It only does us wrong to go down that line of reasoning, that faulty reasoning. It leaves us vulnerable to that which threatens us and our loved ones, sin, death, and the devil. The fools play pretend. 
not the Christians. We Christians, we look the wolf square in the face as bold and brazen sheep. Yes, sheep who can't defend ourselves. Sheep can't defend themselves against the danger the wolf poses, but who know we are served by the one and only good shepherd, Jesus Christ. Yeah, we look the wolf, we look death and danger square in the face for the sake of our neighbor so they know what's coming if they don't repent. What did Peter say in today's epistle reading? He himself, Jesus himself, bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might not die to sin, but live to righteousness. That's 1 Peter 2, 24. And because of his good shepherding, we who were straying like sheep have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, our Savior. Saints, the good shepherd laid down his life for you, for his sheep. He did that to confront what harms you, your sin, which leads to death brought on by the devil. There is no danger that you need fear. Your sins, dear saints, have been forgiven. You have been united to Christ's resurrection in your baptism, and the devil has been so thoroughly defeated that hell is his home. Or I like to imagine he sits around a table with the demons playing the new version of Scrabble. Guys, you need not fear suffering. You don't need to pretend that it isn't real in order to cope with it. You don't need to take an early exit because you can't cope with it. That's how the world does it. You are Christ's. If you're afraid of hell or suffering, know that Jesus went to the cross to rescue you and defend you from hell's grasp and to turn your suffering into a wonderful, wonderful joy connecting your cross to Christ's cross. And if you're afraid of losing a game of Scrabble, well, then might I suggest reading a book from time to time? Huh? You'd be surprised how a little word knowledge might actually help you take advantage of that triple bonus. Read something. <laughs> Jesus laid down his life for you, friends. He is your good shepherd. He knows you, and you know him. He's the one who squared off with the wolf and won. Amen and alleluia. If this sermon was a blessing to you and yours, if you want to share it with somebody, it, yeah, that's the only way it could be a blessing to them. I give thanks to God. And if you want to watch more sermons, the whole playlist is right here. If you want to watch this week's initial thoughts, how I started to address this sermon and deal with the texts. You can watch the initial thoughts video right here. It was a live stream, and here's the replay. I hope it will be a blessing to you and yours. No sermon video next week because I will be on vacation, and no initial thoughts video as well as I will be on vacation. I'll see you, though, in the next video when it drops. <laughs>